I think I was starting Mass. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies, uh, St. Albert the Great Lecture. This lecture is part of our Quinn family series of lectures that we host uh, every year. Uh, four major lectures on the feast of St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Joseph, and St. Catherine of Siena. The St. Albert the Great lecture, as you know, is, uh, revolves around rather faith, science, and reason and the interplay of those three areas. We are delighted this afternoon to in, uh, welcome Dr. Peter Kilpatrick. Uh, Dr. Kilpatrick is the McCloskey Dean of Engineering at the University of Notre Dame, that other Catholic college. <laughs> it is a position he has held since January of 2008. He received an AB degree in chemistry from Occidental College and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. From 1983 through 2007, he was on the faculty of chemical engineering at North Carolina State University, or as we say from where I'm from, NC State. <laughs> I'm from Virginia, where he served as department chair from 1999 to 2007 and founding director of the North Carolina Biomanufacturing Training and Education Center from 2004 to 2007. His research focuses on the self-assembly of molecular species and their surface and interfacial activity, areas in which he has published more than 100 papers. And you thought I gave you a lot of work to do. Since 2009, he has taught a course in technology, engineering, and ethics at the University of Notre Dame. In 2010, he co-organized a conference in Budapest with Dr. Tomas Roska of the Pasmani Peter Katholik University, entitled Human Dignity in the Modern Academy, Challenges at the Interface of Science, Technology, and Medicine. He currently serves as the chairman of the Fetzer Institute Advisory Council on the Engineering Professions, an organization which identifies global projects in engineering and technology that exemplify the power of love and forgiveness to transform the emerging global community. Peter is an adult convert to Catholicism and has been actively engaged in adult religious education since 1985. Since we take the integration of faith, science, and reason rather seriously here at Providence College, it is indeed our pleasure to welcome you here to speak to us today. Dr. Kilpatrick. Yeah. Thank you, Father Greg. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Excuse me while I load up my talk. Here we go. Got it. Great. Well, it's this is my first time in Providence, so uh, it's it's a real joy to to be here with you today. Uh, I, I I've shared with several people that my mother was was born just a short distance away in New Bedford, so uh, it's great to come to this part of the country, and uh, I'd like to share with you for 45, 50 minutes on the topic of beauty and its role in science and creation, and in particular, how beauty helps us integrate knowledge. Uh, and I think this is a particularly important topic because there's been a lot of discussion, both nationally and internationally, about the role of universities in the 21st century in improving society, in uh, helping to stimulate economies, in um, becoming more engaged in uh, the polity and the society of nations. And I think there's a very important uh, point that needs to be drawn, and that is that universities have really departed from being universities and they've become multiversities. And it, it's a challenge that really needs to be addressed. Uh, and a number of people have written about this. Alistair McIntyre most recently uh, published a 2009 book on this exact topic. So I'm going to introduce the topic of beauty and how that might help us with this whole issue of uh, multiversities versus universities. So one of the aspects that I'm going to touch on is beauty in nature. And in particular, how beauty in nature helps us create and discover in the world of science and, and engineering. 
And we'll move from there to what that means in terms of ways of knowing. Um, so an outline of the lecture. Why study beauty? Why is beauty so important to us? What's, what's, so, um, what, what's critical about beauty? We know beauty is a transcendental, but uh, how does that transcendental inform us and help us learn and help us know? What is beauty? That might sound like a pretty simple question, but uh, many of you have heard that adage, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, you might gather from that that you can't really come up with a good definition of beauty. I'm not exactly sure that's right, but uh, so we'll work a little bit on what is beauty. Beauty and elegance in science. I'm going to maintain that beauty is, is central to discovery in science. In fact, we really can't advance science unless we consider beauty and elegance and simplicity. And then form and radiant form. And this is really going to be the focus of my talk. What is form? What is radiant form? What did Aquinas mean by the word claritas? How does that relate to form? And then ultimately, where does beauty lead us? And then I'll make some concluding remarks. OK, so why is beauty so important? Well, uh, John Henry Newman and the idea of a university talked a lot about the importance of the liberal arts in forming universities. And in particular, uh, Liberal arts are those uh, subjects or studies that liberate us. That's the origin of the word. And they liberate us to be fully human. And what is it that humans do? What, what, is, what is it that's distinctive about human persons? Well, because we're the imitation and likeness of God, we do what God does. And God's two primary uh, roles as actor are to know and to love. Okay, And to know and to love, we have to know something, and what we know is truth. In fact, that's what the, what's what the intellect seizes on. The intellect is, is very attracted to truth. But more, more importantly, truth being wisdom, goodness, and virtue. And in fact, these are all interrelated. You know, all the transcendentals are connected to each other. Now, Socrates and Plato said, we, we can't really know unless we order how we think. And, and we can't order things unless we make them whole. So there's an element to knowledge and ultimately to loving that relates to integrity. And that's another, uh, that's another quality of knowledge that Aquinas uh, really seized on. So the origins of the liberal arts. Uh, we talk in terms of the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium is the foundation. That's grammar, rhetoric, uh, dialectic, and in particular logic. And the quadrivium is the application of number or mathematics to what was known at that time about the real world. And, and that's why they were called the art real. And these were arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And we think the, the liberal arts really uh, were promoted and, and discussed originally by Marcus Varro in the first century, but then ultimately by Augustine, Berthius, and Cassiodorus in the fourth and fifth centuries. And we think that's really where they came from, the liberal arts. So actually, the liberal arts is now the foundation stone of every education in every major college and university in the world. And that's where, that's where they originated. Now, Dorothy Sayers, that mystery writer and, and commentator of the 20th century, made the point that knowledge had begun to be fragmented. And she, she said it was primarily because we'd lost the trivium. We'd lost the foundation stone in this liberal arts education. We'd lost the ability to think logically and clearly and to have rhetoric and dialectic and uh, there was something that wasn't quite uh, integral about how well we learned those building blocks upon which we were then building what's called the servile arts. And I, and I think there's some truth to this. For example, in my own discipline, uh, you know, students are learning uh, mathematics and chemistry and physics 
and biology, and then they're building on top of that engineering sciences, and they're learning control theory and thermodynamics and all these wonderful disciplines, but a lot of them haven't yet mastered logic. They haven't mastered logic or rhetoric, and they haven't mastered dialectic, and they haven't mastered the ability just really to think critically and clearly and synthetically. And this is, this is a big loss. This is, this is uh, something that really damages the ability to assimilate all that information that you want them to assimilate. And so she talked in terms of people were becoming experts in, in servile things, but not really educated, not really completely educated. Well, I'm going to make the point that I think beauty can bring un understanding to, and meaning to what we know, to what we learn. And, and I'm going to maintain that it's going to help us reintegrate our knowledge. Beauty can do that. At least that's going to be the primary thesis of my talk. OK, so let's talk a little bit about what comes on top of the trivium, the quadrivium. OK, so I talked about arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And if you think about these four um, elements of the quadrivium, arithmetic is numbers. And in fact, I would argue that's pure numbers. Geometry are numbers in space to make shapes and mm, different elements of, of uh, uh, both one, two, three, and many dimensional space. Music is number in time. And astronomy is number in space and time. So in some sense, you know, the quadrivium is all about numbers. But it's, it's about specific ways of understanding numbers. And I think you could argue that a lot of the servile arts that have grown out of the quadrivium, like engineering, are just a, an extension of these original four. In fact, I, I gave a lecture one time where I maintained that civil engineering was really just uh, the quadrivium remade in terms of geometry uh, and arithmetic. Now, the civil engineers don't like that too much when you kind of reduce them to a couple of the quadrivium, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Okay, so now let's talk about beautiful. When we talk about beauty, we typically couch beauty in terms of how it makes us react. And how do people characterize things that they think are beautiful? Well, I would argue that these are some of the adjectives they use. They, they talk about something being awesome or full of splendor or delightful or pleasing to the eye. Some people talk about it being mysterious. Beauty is somewhat mysterious. It humbles us. It makes us thankful. These are just some of the, some of the uh, adjectives, some of the feelings I think people have about beauty. The dictionary defines beauty in the following way. Again, a pleasing quality associated with harmony of form or color, excellence of craftsmanship, truthfulness, originality, or other often unspecifiable property. I tried to parse this definition in the following way. I, I would argue that pleasing, or I guess uh, Aquinas talks about pulchre and pulchritudo, you know, and that's essentially what that means. So that's, that's a pretty good word. Harmony, I think what's meant there is um, balance or proportion, and I'm going to make the argument that a lot of time there's a very important element of symmetry in, in beauty. In fact, it's a, it's a key component. And again, Aquinas talked about um, cons consonantia, or consonants, which is essentially is harmony. Uh, form, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue especially radiant form. Um, and we're gonna define what we mean by that. Truth, truth, or truthfulness, so the, again, the transcendentals are all kind of bound together. Uh, originality, and then there's this very important element to beauty that relates to mystery. So there's something about beauty where it's never completely, totally understood. So there's always something that we can't quite get our mind around, that we don't totally understand. And you can characterize that in a number of ways, but I would argue that 
something that's awesome or majestic or, or full of splendor or wonderful, you could, you could argue is also something that I don't totally understand this. There's something that, that leaves me in awe and I recognize about myself that I don't totally get it. And that's, that's actually a very important component of beauty. I've already mentioned pretty much all the dimensions of what Aquinas says on beauty, but again, he, he, sub, he subscribes to the notion that there are three really important dimensions to polker or polker tuto, and that is integritas or wholeness and integrity, uh, consonantia, harmony, symmetry, and proportion, and claritas or radiance and form. Okay, so let's look at some examples. I, I hope my examples are illustrative enough that, that you'll be able to say, yeah, I, I get it. You know, I, I see that that's in fact the case. So we're going to talk about the golden proportion, which I think is just a great example. Um, symmetry and mystery in nature, all the different examples of symmetry. We'll talk about the Big Bang. That's a great one. And then the anthropic co uh, coincidences, which you may have heard about. So we'll, we'll run through these, and then we'll get to some ideas about form. So what is the golden proportion? How many people know what the golden proportion is? Okay, I see a few hands going up. So the golden proportion, very simply, is the number which characterizes the ratio of A to B such that a divided by B is the same number as A plus B, the whole length, divided by A. So it's a very simple definition, but it has a very interesting consequence. So if I, if I solve that quadratic equation, so phi, which I'm going to call, I'm going to call it phi, <laughs> phi is to 1 as phi plus 1 is to phi. That's just another way of rewriting this proportion that I just wrote up there. And then if I reduce that to a quadratic equation and solve it, the root that is, uh, the root that is real is this number, 1.618, and I've only written out the first few decimals of it. Now, that's a very interesting number. In fact, it's, it's just kind of amazing. If I make a triangle where the longer edge of the triangle to the shorter edge is phi. So this, this number right here is phi and this number right here is 1. And the interesting thing about it is that if I, I put a spiral, if I inscribe a spiral into the rectangle, every one of these smaller rectangles is also a golden rectangle, which is kind of amazing. Hmm, how'd that happen? Okay. Uh, Fibonacci, in the 14th century, discovered that I could create these rectangles that I'm showing in this slide right here by introducing what came to be known as the Fibonacci sequence. Namely, if I start with 0 and 1, and then I form as my next number just the sum of the previous two numbers. So the next number after 0 and 1 would be 1, because that's 0 plus 1. The next one would be 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on. And then I just start creating uh, uh, rectangles that have those areas. I generate that rectangle sequence that I just showed on the previous slide. Hmm. That's kind of weird. What's going on here? Well, Fibonacci and Euler, who were the first to really define these, weren't the first to figure out that there was such a thing as a golden proportion or a golden rectangle. The Greeks knew about this. And in fact, they built the Parthenon precisely to the golden rectangle and the golden proportion. Ooh. That's kind of mysterious. In fact, it's kind of spooky. Okay, but they weren't the only ones. Um, the Egyptians knew about the golden rectangle and the golden pyramid. 
And they knew about it three or 4,000 years before you know, the, the Greeks did. That's, that's kind of strange. Gosh, who didn't know about the golden rectangle? Well, Leonardo knew about the golden rectangle. Seems like everybody knows about the golden rectangle and the golden proportion. So where does it come from? So this is, this is a very fascinating question. Where do irrational numbers like five come from? I heard a, a presentation by a Fields medalist from Princeton. This was about a year and a half, two years ago. And he, he gave this very interesting talk on a little bit on the history of mathematics, but also how uh, subcategories of mathematics were beginning to converge. And all through his talk, he, he would make statements like, and Galois discovered this, and so-and-so discovered that, and, and about mathematics. And at the end of the talk, people raised their hands, and someone asked, you know, Professor so-and-so, you keep talking about uh, discovery in mathematics. Does mathematics exist apart from human persons, and is it something to be discovered? And he got kind of upset by that question. He was like, no, 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 it's totally a human invention. Well, why do you keep saying discovered if you really think it's a totally human invention? And he didn't have a good answer for that. Um, so where do irrational numbers like phi come from? It's hard to imagine that we could invent an irrational number. And in fact, we don't invent irrational numbers. We discover irrational numbers. Numbers like pi, which is another interesting number, and phi, just seem to arise naturally. You know, that golden proportion is a pretty simple mathematical construct. And so I would argue that irrational and transcendental numbers appear to fly in the face of a purely reductionist uh, or materialistic approach to nature. And I'm going to call that pure ratio. So ratio means kind of uh, reason reduced to its simplest element, which, and, I'm, and I'm, what I really mean by that is reductionist or materialistic. Let's look at another example, harmony or balance or symmetry. And we're also going to bring into this a little bit of mystery. So I'm going to give some examples from nature, snowflakes and crystals, plants and animals, and some other things. And I'm going to try to have a common theme here that symmetry combined with minor symmetry breaking is, is the operative idea when we look at harmony or symmetry in nature. So what do I mean by that? Well, look at these, look at these snowflakes. Have you ever looked at a snowflake kind of up close and personal? They're, they're, they're fascinating. They're absolutely fascinating. So all of these snowflakes, here's a nice one, very nice hexagonal symmetry. And if you look at the real fine details of the snowflake, it appears to be totally symmetrical, but it's not. There's always defects in the snowflake. And in fact, if you look carefully, I, I hope you can see those defects. They're present in every one of those snowflakes. Some of the defects are bigger than other defects, but they're in all of them. So what's, what's thematic about this? Symmetry, harmony, proportion, but something a little mysterious. Something just a little unique about every one of those snowflakes. How about trees? Trees are symmetric. Um, I hope you can see the symmetry in those two examples. But lots of, lots of mysterious asymmetry built into those trees. How about, uh, how about a flower? How about, if, have you ever looked really closely at a flower? There's all kinds of symmetry there. It's mostly uh, what the chemists call uh, you know, D-type symmetry sometimes C-type symmetry, but lots of asymmetry in there. So there's, there's a lot of subgroups, a symmetrical subgroups, if you've ever studied uh, group theory, represented in that, in that flower, but there's also a lot of mysterious asymmetry. How about our little friend right here? He's got a lot of symmetry in him, but if you look real carefully at his eyelashes and you compare them from one eye to the other, 
there's a lot of very interesting asymmetry in there. And there's, there's a lot of other asymmetry in there, but mostly symmetrical. And the pumpkin, you know, the pumpkin's pretty symmetrical, but the stem on it, you know, there's a lot of asymmetry in the stem. So very fascinating. And then if you go look at nature, you look at fullerenes and carbon nanotubes and buckyballs, and we've even started making buckyballs out of actinides like plutonium and uranium and all kinds of other elements now. And it turns out the buckyballs are not as unique as we thought they were. We don't just have carbon buckyballs. We've got all kinds, we've got uranium buckyballs, we've got plutonium, we've got lanthanum, we've got mixtures of uranium and plutonium, we've, we've got all kinds of buckyballs but they always have defects in them. There, there's always some little asymmetry in the buckyball or in, or in the carbon nanotube. They're never perfect. Very interesting. And uh, now I'm not a physicist, so I'm a, I'm a chemist. So are there any physicists in the audience? So I'm gonna get in trouble. But, but I do know that uh, Murray Gell-Mann uh, discovered the unified field theory for the electroweak force by studying the symmetry properties of hypercharge and isospin, and specifically how hadrons relate to baryons. That's about all I know about subatomic particles. But what I do know is Murray said the following. He said, one thing that makes the adventure of working in our field particularly rewarding <laughs> especially in attempting to improve the theory, he was a theorist, he was not an experimentalist, is that a chief criterion for the selection of a correct hypothesis is beauty, simplicity, or elegance. And in fact, Murray Gell-Mann in the 50s, late 50s, pr proposed his theory of symmetry for hypercharge and isospin long before it had ever been observed experimentally. And the first few experiments that got done contradicted his theory. And he said, the experiments are wrong. They have to be wrong. And then the next experiment was done, and it contradicted his theory, and he said it's wrong. And he said this until the seventh experiment was done. And the seventh experiment agreed with his theory. And then people did hundreds of experiments, and they all agreed with the theory. Fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. Poincaré, a mathematician, said, if nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing. And if nature were not worth knowing, life would not be worth living. I, I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but I, I, I pretty much agree with what he's saying there. Einstein. Now, people have argued about, was Einstein a man of faith or not? Well. I have deep faith. He, sa he said he had faith. But his faith was that the principle of the universe will be beautiful and simple. I would, I would add to that, and mysterious. There will be something mysterious about it that we will never know. The most but then he goes on to say the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. Okay, let's talk about form now. Now most of you have an understanding of what you mean by form. When I talk about form, I, I'm referring to the shape of something, or the outline of something, or its outward appearance, or I might be referring to literary form, I might be referring to prose or poetry or something like that, or I might be referring to a particular mode of existence, or I might be referring to a musical form. So you you have that understanding of form. But I'm talking about form in the ontological sense. So form, in that sense, in the, in the uh, Greek philosophical sense, is the deep down invisible reality that explains specific diversities. So form is what gives rise to the essence of something. That's form. Form is the deep root of a being's actuality, which gives it its whatness. It is the actualizing principle of a thing, the mysterious taproot, and why it's different from every other thing. That's what form is. 
Um, Jacques Maritain says form is the ontological secret that things bear with them. They're operating mystery. Uh, the proper principle of intelligibility, that's what form is. It makes something intelligible. Okay? And I would argue the only reason we can have science is because we believe nature is intelligible. If we thought nature was unintelligible, we couldn't even, we couldn't even do science. And in fact, there's a wonderful book by uh, Stanley Jackie, if you've ever read it, Science and Creation, uh, where he takes 400 pages and unpacks why the Chinese, why the, uh, the Indians in Latin America, why the Arabs didn't invent science. Because at root, they didn't believe that the universe was intelligible. They thought, they thought the universe was partially divine and that there were a bunch of gods that kind of competed with each other for uh, making the universe the way that it is. So Jackie says, no, um, you got to have two things to, to have science. One is you've got to believe that the world or the universe is not divine. In fact, it's created. It's created by the divine, but it's not divine. And the second thing is you have to, have intel you have to believe in intelligibility of the universe, or you, c you, can't, ha you can't even have science. Uh, Maritain agrees. Um, form is the reason we can know and understand reality, and thus it is the source of light in things. It's, it's, it's what gives rise to inner radiance. The reason we can know something, the reason we can see something, the reason we can understand something is because of form, and in particular, radiant form. Okay, so I want to give just a couple of examples. This is, a, this is an x-ray picture of the sun. We, we almost never get to see the sun this way, because we don't have x-ray eyes, you know. In fact, we never do look at the sun. But there's a lot going on on that fellow right there, isn't it? Right? Um, so I did a little calculation. The sun, the sun converts 6.57 times 10 to the 8 tons of hydrogen, almost a billion tons of hydrogen, to slightly less than almost a billion tons of helium every second. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Um, and in fact, you can use this handy dandy little formula that Einstein came up with and you can calculate what the radiant energy of the sun is. And it's about 10 to the 26 watts. That's a lot of, that's a lot of power being generated by the sun every, every second, right? Um, by the way, the worldwide energy needs, even if we quadruple it to the year 2050, is about, oh, a millionth of that, a little less than a millionth of that. In six billion years, the sun will consume, oh, a, uh, almost a, a, a two and a half thousandths of a percent of its mass. But that's not the problem. We're not going to run out of the sun. In six billion years, it'll blow up. And as my son Charlie says, you know, then it's kind of all over, you know, when, the, you know, but. Um. Now, this is a picture of the earliest part of the universe. So this is a picture from the Hubble telescope of very deep space. And those are not stars, those are galaxies. So what we're looking at, and you can see a bunch of them, those are some of the earliest galaxies that were formed um, a few hundred billion years after uh, you know, the Earth uh, or the universe was formed. So here's another interesting uh, thing, uh, a black hole has a density corresponding to all the mass in the universe. So that's about 100 billion galaxies, each one of which has about 3 billion stars, or about 10 to the 20th stars compressed into a star the size of our sun. So if you imagine all the mass in the universe and squeeze it down into our sun, that would be about the mass of, of a black hole. It's it's pretty massive, about 10 to the 21 grams per cc. But now if we take all that mass 
and we compress it down into the size of a proton. So not our sun anymore, but about 10 to minus 15 centimeters. That's an increase of 80 orders of magnitude on this density. So a little over 10 to the hundredth grams per cc. That's the density of the universe about just shortly after things got going. 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the beginning of the universe. Pretty massive. And in fact, at zero time, the density and temperature of the universe were infinite. They were, they were singularities. Um, and in fact, the Big Bang is kind of a misnomer. Because as best we can tell, Stephen Weinberg, um, Stephen Hawking, as best we can tell, it really wasn't a bang. It was a very smooth, continuous transition from this point of infinite temperature and density to the universe as, as we know it. And in some sense, that sounds a whole lot like creation from nothing, doesn't it? So you, ha you have something that has n no spatial extent. It's infinite in mass. It's, it, do it doesn't really explode. It just kind of, that, that it, it sounds a lot like, to me, like creation ex nihilo. Here's a nice little picture of that. Uh, you can find this online. It's a pretty, pretty neat picture. Um, I think, yeah, I, I misspoke a few minutes ago. Those, those galaxies that we saw were 300,000 years, or a little more than 300,000 years after the Big Bang, not billions of years. Okay, so here's some ideas. The Big Bang reveals infinities and singularities to us. Uh, temperature, density, and a singular time. It was neither a bang nor was it simply big. How should this, in, how should this inform us about ourselves? Now I'm going to skip anthropic coincidences. How many of you have heard of anthropic coincidences? You know, maybe I'll just say a few brief words. The, there's been a lot written on this uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and in fact, a lot of the most famous physicists have gotten an, into the act. Uh, Roger Penrose, uh, Stephen Hawking, a number of really famous physicists have written on anthropic coincidences. And essentially what they say is, it appears that the universe is so finely tuned that ah, there, there really is almost no leeway as to what the fundamental constants that define the universe could have been. They, they had to have been in this very narrow range or we could never have had human life. We never could have had 110 elements. We never could have had carbon-based life. We never could have had water that uh, you know, expands when it, when it freezes instead of condenses, which is what gives life in the ocean. We, there are so many things that just couldn't have been unless everything was just tuned precisely. And here's some of those anthropic coincidences. The strong nuclear force can be no more than 10% weaker nor 4% stronger than what it is. Why? Well, because when the Big Bang happened, if the strong nuclear force had been a little bit stronger, everything would have been collapsed back into you know, a singular point again. And if it had been a little bit weaker, things would have just kept right on expanding and we never would have coalesced galaxies and stars and planets. So it's pretty narrow range. Um, re the resonant energy of carbon-12 for the chemists in the crowd cannot vary by 3%, or three alpha particles would never combine to form a carbon-12. So, so one of the amazing things about our planet and about life and about why we exist is because the only way you get carbon atoms you don't make them from two atoms coming together. You've got to have three atoms come together. And those three atoms coming together have to have exactly the right resonant energy or you don't get carbon. And there's a bunch of others. I'm, I'm not going to go through them all. There are books and papers written on the anthropic coincidences. So the answer of people who struggle with belief in a designed universe or belief in God is that, well, there must be an infinity of universes. There must be an infinity of universes. And we can only see the one that we're in. 
And the reason everything is tuned so fine is because we exist to observe it. And the only reason we exist to observe it is because it happens to be that one of an infinity of universes where all these numbers worked out just right. That's the answer. If you read Brian Greene's book, The Elegant Universe, that's what he says. I struggle with that a little bit, quite honestly. You know, an infinity, excuse me, an infinity of universes? Why do you, so the multiverse. Um, that's essentially what I say on that slide. Okay. So we've talked about radiant form. I, I would just jump to a punchline now for you. Uh, the outer appearance of all this mystery, all this hiddenness and manifestation is really what being is. It's really what being is. So radiant form and beauty ultimately reveal being. And being is what helps us know and love. Being is what helps us know and love. Now I want to take just my last few moments and introduce you to the concept of leisure. And because leisure leads us to a very important um, activity that helps us apprehend beauty. So the Greeks had a word for leisure, and that word was skola. It's where we get the word school from. So skola, or Latin skola, English school, is our modern word leisure. So Aristotle said, we work a scolia so that we can be at leisure scola. Well, that's kind of interesting. So what is it that we're doing here at this university? What are we doing here at this college? What is the activity that we ultimately should be about? Well, you should be working, right? You, you should be studying hard. But more importantly, you should a scolia so that you can scola. You should work hard so that you can contemplate wholeness, so that you can reflect in an integral way on knowledge and love. And in fact, um, the, the medieval scholastics had two different words for intellection. Ratio and intellectus. And ratio comes from the Latin word discurere, which is where we get discursive meditation from, where you think and you analyze and you dissect and you tease apart and you, uh, you abstract and so forth. And intellectus is the word that the scholastics use to mean receptive looking, to gaze, to gaze upon the beauty of something to gaze in a way where you apprehend it holistically and with, with, with integration. And I would argue this is, this is what we're in danger of losing in a lot of colleges and universities today. And I, I drew a little diagram here. Oh, Heraclitus and Aquinas have something to say about uh, discursive reasoning and uh, intellectual vision and simple knowing. I'm going to skip this if that's OK. Beauty helps us reflect on purpose and telos. And hopefully that leads us to this simple knowing. And when we get really good at that, that's called virtue. And, and I would argue that's what leads to a, a true awareness of being. And I, I would hope that's what we're going to get back to in universities, because right now I think we have multiversities. We don't have universities. Or hope, maybe what you have here is a, maybe you have a uni college here, you know? Hopefully, hopefully you do. Okay, so here's just a couple of images, and I'm going to conclude with an idea on real beauty. So I put these two photos here. This is from The Passion of the Christ. And the, you know, this is the actor Jim Caviezel playing Christ in The Passion. And the, you know, the, the photo on the left is, looks like a first century Jew in, in Palestine. And the photo of the right, at first glance, 
you might say, well, that's, that's kind of repugnant. You know, that's, you know, I don't know if the, you, I don't think you would use the word ugly, but that, that, that may not strike you initially as being beautiful. But I would argue exactly the opposite. I would argue that this is the visible icon of truth, beauty, and goodness itself. Because what Christ did on the cross is he said, you know, I'm not into pleasure. I'm not into power. I'm not into all these false gods. I'm into emptying myself completely so that you can have life. And that's, that's exactly what that's an icon of. And in fact, probably the most beautiful example of that is the, the Eisenheim altarpiece. I, I would argue this is, this is real beauty. And that all other beauty, all, all those other examples that I show you are simply an imitation, a participation in real truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, an imitation. And we see that in the lives of the saints. We see that in Mary. I, I love this picture of John Paul because it shows John Paul at the end of his life having spent himself in service to the church. You know, so here he is. He's, he's been through cancer surgeries. He's got, probably got Parkinson's. I think this was taken in 2002. And he's smiling. He's, he's probably struggling to smile at this little child. And to me, that just, that kind of says it all. And then, of course, uh, here's another picture, another picture. And then there was Mother Teresa. So I would argue that there's something really beautiful about the saints. And what's really beautiful about them is that they're transformed in Christ. And they have, they have this wholeness. They have this harmony to them. And they have this radiance. And the radiance is the radiance of Christ. Uh, now, most every idea I shared with you, I stole from somebody else. Um, so I'm going to give as complete a bibliography as I can. Um, uh, Steve Barr wrote a book called Modern Physics, Ancient Faith. Steve's a good friend of mine. It's a beautiful book. I've, I've got a copy back in the hotel room. A wonderful book. If you're interested in all the work on symmetry, all the work on nature, that, that's a great place to go. Uh, Caldecott uh, published a book a couple years ago by Brazos on Beauty for Truth's Sake, great book. Uh, Father Dubay, Thomas Dubay, wrote a book called Evidential Power of Beauty, which is an excellent book on beauty. Um, I took a lot of ideas from him. Joseph Pieper, uh, the philosopher, wrote a great book on leisure. Uh, I took my ideas on leisure out of his book. Uh, there's a nice book uh, by Professor Sharap on explaining the universe, where I took some of my stuff on anthropic coincidences. Uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote The Glory of the Lord, seven volumes. And then uh, Father Robert Barron, who I believe is coming in February, gave a lecture last week at Notre Dame called Evangelizing the Culture that was just spectacular. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy uh, Father Barron when, when he comes to Providence College. And, uh, with that, I'll conclude, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I have a comment and maybe two questions. Short. First, I want to thank you for proving that mathematics is the heart of everything, since I'm a mathematician. <laughs> uh, but secondly, um, it disturbs me that you used pleasing because that seems subjective. Now, most of the other things you said could have some basis in object, but that still had a subjectiveness there. Okay. The other thing is, I've always been disturbed that the 20th century seemed to pull apart so many things. We had the Gödel uh, incompleteness theorem, the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. We, uh, then, then we had quantum mechanics and chaos theory. It seemed all the nice things that we were able to point to as 
beautiful in culture. They seem to be getting more and more complicated, and they seem to be too random. Do you have any comments on that idea? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. Um, with regards to the pleasing question, um, the reason I use pleasing is it was in the dictionary definition. I, so I, that was my starting point. And I, I guess the other reason I used pleasing is it's right out of Aquinas. I mean, pulcher and pulchritudo. But um, your point's well taken. It, there's an unfortunate element of subjectivity to that. Uh, your other point is, is, an, is also a very good question, very excellent point. Um, much of the way science advances is reductionist, much of it. And you can point to the 20th century, but, but I would make the following comment, and, and this is stunning to me. This is, in fact, I, ever since I reflected on this, I, I, I never tire of sharing this point with people. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we thought, we, I wasn't around at the beginning of the 20th. Believe it or not, I'm not that old. But anyway, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, many physicists thought we'd solved every problem that was going to be solved. And if you knew the position and velocity of molecules, atoms, et cetera, the whole world was deterministic on the basis of Newtonian mechanics. And five years later, you know, a little Swiss patent clerk just shot that one all to heck, and you know, the course was just of history and science was just changed forever. Well, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, um, there were a group of astronomers who made a curious observation, and they said, you know, the rotational velocity of galaxies, it does not comport with what we know about luminosity and mass of galaxies. So something is seriously amiss. And there must be something called dark energy, and there must be something called dark matter. And they got laughed back to the dark ages, no pun intended. Um, they, they just got they, got, they couldn't publish a paper. They got booed off stage when they gave their paper. This was 1982. 29 years ago. Well, today, it is dogma. It is physics dogma that there is such a thing as dark energy and dark matter and dark forces, even though we've never seen it, we've never done an experiment that proves it. It's pure conjecture. So think, meditate on that for a moment. Let's see. We've never seen it, we've never done an experiment, and yet it's dogmatic in science. And it makes up most of what's there. And it makes up most of what's there. That's kind of scary. So I guess the way I would answer your question is, the more we know about the physical world, the less we know. It's, it's kind of, and I think it speaks volumes to this notion of the mysteriousness of beauty. I think it just speaks volumes to it. But great question. Thank you. Please. I don't have all the answers. You, you have most of the answers. I hope, you'll, I hope you'll share your thoughts with us. And it comes together in string theory. Is it simplicity? Looking forward to when he died, he could read the proofs in the book 
Yeah. And well, I, d I certainly did not mean to give short shrift to simplicity, and if I did, it was, it was an accident of me moving through the talk perhaps a bit too briskly. But uh, I, I certainly mentioned it in all the areas where I talked about symmetry. I mean, the reason, the reason we can use symmetry as a tool of discovery is because of simplicity. So perhaps I overemphasized the mysterious part, and I didn't adequately emphasize the simplicity part and the elegance part. Uh, but they're, they're critically important. I mean, for example, if you look at scientific equations, E equals mc squared. If, if you look at the equations for string theory, if you look at F equals ma, I mean, just all, all of science advances when it becomes, on the one hand, simpler, on the other hand, I would argue more mysterious. I mean, I mean to me, dark energy and dark matter are, are striking in how they just turn everything on its head in terms of what we know about. I mean, we had known the four primary forces for a, for a long time before we started to integrate them. And, and now it seems like we're back at a point where we don't know all the forces. We don't know all the energy. We don't know all the pieces of matter. Well, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's only a, a part that's relevant in the sense of thinking that we think about the the fair, fair enough. And that was, uh, that, was Gel that was one of Gelman's big points in, in his comment. Yeah. So I didn't mean to give short shrift to simplicity. But again, I, I would argue 
that things are not simply getting simpler. They're, they're, they're getting a combination of simpler and more mysterious at the same time. When you adapt the, the solutions to this an equation of string theory, you gave an infinite number of solutions. At first they thought there were none, then they came up with too many. Yeah, so I, that's both simple and deeply mysterious. It's like, oh my gosh, how, how do we decide between millions of possible theories? Now let me one comment follow up. Nobody <laughs> is running. I couldn't stop theory. you if I tried. No, nobody has Brian Green on. Yeah. He's had two already, and this week is the third one. He's uh, explaining the concept of his book as a fabric of the universe. And the end of the first one says that we're all holograms. Nice. Of some kind of thing on the edge of the universe that is two dimensional and we're just a projection. Well, so one of the thoughts that I had, and I'll, I'll wrap okay, up, I'll wrap up very I'm fine. quickly. No, you're fine. One of the thoughts I had when you asked your first set of questions about aren't, isn't most of what we, we have done in the 20th century is to reduce things and to uh, break them down into bits. And it's interesting because in the science of the mind, what we're discovering now, and, and this is actually consistent with quantum electrodynamics, we're discovering that there are, there are uh, forces and interactions that operate in synchrony. And, and, it, and you can't really understand anything by virtue of individual particles or pieces. You have to put them together to understand the whole. So for example, um, epilepsy and schizophrenia. It turns out are uncontrolled standing electrical waves in the brain and, and not individual loci of, of problems in the brain. Um, and I find that very interesting because that seems to be pointing us in the direction of integration rather than reductionism. And uh, there, there's actually many examples that I could give of this, but I'll stop with that. I just had a quick question about um, this description of radiant form or a form, and you, you, we, we saw a certain symmetry among certain things, but a symmetry with, a, with an edge, so to speak, or a symmetry with a flaw. Right. And I, I'm wondering if in genetic research, if part of the problem in moving forward is that genetic research seeks to imitate a form without its proper flaw. Wow, that's a great, great question. So we keep trying, I mean, because we, we can do the symmetry part of it, but we can't, we can't get the, the mistake. Well, the other, I mean, I if would just, a mistake. I would add to your comment or your question by, by pointing out that the way evolution works, molecular evolution, and the way that um, genetics works is through error. I mean, we, we can't, we don't get, um, we don't get forms which can move forward evolutionarily unless we have an error in coding. And so, uh, you know, the designer has built in error or mysteriousness as a, as a means, as a tool to ev evolutionarily advance things. And, and actually Steve Barr in his book does a great job of talking about this. Um, it, it's really well done. And he questions whether the, the quantum character of interactions at the genetic level, now you might say, what does is, what is quantum mechanics have to do with genetics? Well, it has a lot to do with genetics because when you get down to the scale of individual base units, there actually, there actually are quantum effects. And he, he argues that the prob probabilistic uh, nature of quantum effects at the level of individual DNA base units may indeed be where these errors occur and, and where evolution advances things. But that's speculative, but it, it's in his book. But uh, it's a great question, Father. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you again, Dr. Kilpatrick. I'd like to invite everyone next door to the Center for Catholic and Dominican Studies, where there is a, a short reception uh, where you can continue this conversation uh, with your mic off now. Um, and uh, we'll be there at least until 6, 6.15, so please join us. Thank you.